So this meeting is recorded and um, I ask everyone to either uh, switch off the cameras if you're not fine with uh, being recorded or let us know also in the chat uh, if that's not okay for you to be recorded. <laughs> We will publish this um, event on our website, Communities for Future, afterwards. So this is why we record it. So I welcome everyone in, in this um, EU Green Week event. And I'm very pleased uh, to see so many people because it's a topic which is very close to my heart. So it's about how to bring the EU Green Deal down to local levels with the help of local action groups and communities. And um, before we start, just a few, um, a few questions. Select gallery view so you can see everyone. So in the right hand upper corners, you see view and then you can click on gallery and gallery view is there so we can have a bit of a feeling that we're together even though we are <laughs> far apart and also to get to know each other because this is what this meeting is also really about please put your name into um into uh, zoom your organization plus your country and this is the way i can just see that i haven't done it myself so i will do it as well <laughs> so I'm Nina Klein, policy lead of Ecolise, and I'm Bel I am based in Belgium, Wallonia. So if all of us could please do this, because I find it always helps to see, you know, where do people come from, which institutions do we represent. Um, so relax and enjoy. That's the last thing that I ask of you with the slide. And then uh, I will always say next slide, please, Abdul. Thank you. So we are here at uh, EU Green Week partner event. And the EU Green Week is really the leading environmental policies flagship event of the EU. And um, the EU Green Week means to ask this time this year how to make the EU Green Deal real. And this is why we're here, because we also want to make the EU Green Deal real and bring it to local levels with the power of local action groups and communities. So uh, we have a very special approach for that. And with the next slide, I will go into that approach a bit. Because Ecolise, uh, I'm policy lead at Ecolise, as I've said already, and if you look into the gallery view, then you will see uh, lots of my colleagues who are here today supporting me in this event. So we have Amelie Krug, who is policy officer at Ecolise. We have uh, Juan Del Rio, who is co-director, and I ask my colleagues in the gallery view just to wave a hand so people can see, can see you. Um, we also have Paulina Helle, who is supporting us today. Thanks, Abdul, for the gallery view. That's wonderful. Um, we have Eamon O'Hara. Where is Eamon? Eamon is, yes, Eamon, the founding uh, director and now development director of Ecolise. So the team also has Justine Monens, who is... Yes, that's Justine. She's volunteering and she, Justine is an expert on biodiversity. So you can see there is a big team here at Ecolise. Ecolise um, will be presented to you by Eamon. Um, and for now, I would just like to go back to the slide and also talk a bit about Ecolise, because Ecolise is about uh, community-led initiatives. And what does that mean? That sounds a bit, you know, strange, community-led initiatives. You can see 47 members in 19 European countries. What's special for me about Ecolise is that they are very special members. So we have um, Permaculture Association, Transition Network, the eco villages, uh, the network of eco villages, but also very strong academic partners like the Center for Alternative Technology in Wales, which is an outcome of an eco village, 
or drift in Rotterdam. So these members got together because they said, we are doing constructive solutions already on the ground. We want to have a voice also at the EU level, at national levels, at regional levels, when it comes to policy. And Abdul, next slide. Thank you. So Communities for Future is where we are right now, and this will be posted also on the website, this event. It's, I call it the Action Network of Ecoles. And uh, Eamon O'Hara, the founding uh, director and now development director of Ecoles, will tell you more about Communities for Future and about community-led initiatives and why Ecoles has partnered in this event also with ELAD. And ELAD is representing local action groups in Europe, 2,500 local action groups in Europe. And we will talk about a very special approach, how to bring the EU Green Deal to local levels, because ELAD, the local action groups, community-led development and community-led initiatives can work together to make that happen. Next slide. So you will learn about the EU Green Deal and we have Laurence Graff of DG Klima here with us. Laurence, if you could also wave your hand so people can see you. <laughs> so Laurence Graff is uh, uh, an, an advisor to DG Klima. Laurence works uh, for bringing the EU Green Deal to local levels also with the help of the EU Climate Pact. Um, we will also highlight the role of local actors. So one of the questions of the EU Green Week is how can we make, make it happen locally? And I think that's one of the big unresolved questions. It's really a mystery because the EU can do stuff at EU levels, then there's the member state level. But the big question is how can we transport, implement the EU Green Deal on local levels. <clears throat> we will give you some good practice examples because there are cooperations between community-led initiatives and local action groups already working on the ground. And also, if you ever wondered what community-led local development is, then you will find out today more about it because on one hand it's an eu method which is proven and tested on the ground and on the other hand it is also what it means so it is development rural development but also city development led by communities and next slide please <clears throat> so just quickly about the structure, we will have a welcome and introduction, which we are in right now. We'll have a bit of theory because I think we need the framework, EU Green Deal, what is it? CLLD or community-led local development, what is that? What can communities on the ground do to enable uh, the EU Green Deal on local levels? But we will also have good practice examples, both from local action groups, which are parts of community-led lo local development, and of community-led initiatives, so members of Ecolis. At about 12.10, we have uh, 10 minutes of break, and we're going to stretch in between as well. Don't worry. Um, and now we can see somebody's, yes. <laughs> so in between, we will have some time to stretch and rest our eyes as well. But at 12.10, 12, we will have a break. And after that, this is really the time for networking. So stay on if you're interested in getting to know the people who are present here. Be patient and you will be rewarded. Next slide. Um, We've already done that, and um, there is now uh, a session about which we've prepared for you to make it a bit more interactive. Let's have a look. How many people are we here in the gallery? Okay, we have 70 participants. Great, wonderful. So I take this moment just to bring us together and acknowledge who is here in this virtual space. So take a look around. 
if you want to, you can turn on your camera so people can see you. Just take a look around and see 70 people interested in this very specific method of community-led local development and how to bring the EU Green Deal to local levels. And we've got a few waves. Great. So now I think is the time for a Mentimeter because um, the Mentimeter is something which you might know, which you might not know. It's uh, it's a little gadget which lets us all connect though although we're in a virtual space and uh, we have prepared a few questions for you and i to ask my colleagues now to put the link to the mentimeter if they have it in the chat great so please uh, follow Nina, this. Nina, just, yeah. just a second the link is there and i've also shared before the link to the overall presentation document that we will follow through the whole session great okay? thank you thank You're you Juan. yes so if you see now, look, have a look in the chat and follow this Mentimeter link. And we want to know why are you here? What are your expectations towards this event? And we also want to know, because we will start with a theory level. So what is your level of knowledge about the EU Green Deal? And then more specifically, CLLD. I'm going to use this acronym a lot, so get used to it. It's community-led local development. So just to assess the the you know the knowledge in the room. I hope everybody sees the link. And you can see the responses that they are appearing. Yes, wonderful. I just my screen, and you can start to see them. So we have 14 responses for now, 15. It's going fast. If you look at the number in the bottom right side. Twenty. So I let you Nina to interpret the responses a little bit. Yes. Thank you. You can also put your questions and expectations into the, into the chat because the chat will be saved afterwards and we will make good use of your questions. Okay. So the expectations are actually about networking, which will start at 12.20. Uh, so after the break, there is a networking session where we have uh, a possibility to get to know each other, knowledge, Learning, yes, good practice examples. Cooperation and the Green Deal, I can see as well. So bringing the Green Deal to local levels. Wonderful. So I guess um, it's time for the next question, which is more of a learning question. I hope you don't feel like at school, <laughs> but we would like to know what do you know about the EU Green Deal? So again, it's a Mentimeter exercise because um, my experience and I am a EU Climate Pact ambassador. So what Laurence Graff will talk about is something that I support uh, very strongly. So the easy question is, what do you know? What's your level of knowledge about the EU Green Deal? And again, here we can see the responses. Wow. OK, so basic knowledge is there in the room. Familiar, some people are familiar with it. No clue. I love that. That's it's very important to say when you have no clue, because that's and the only starting. one expert. We have one expert. We have one expert. <laughs> one. I Who think is that's that expert, Laurence. Nina? <laughs> that's Laurence, I guess. Yes, wonderful. <laughs> okay. Um, and the third question was um, the acronym, acronym CLLD, which is Community Led Local Development. What's your state of knowledge about that? And I think now the numbers will be probably going down. Okay, one moment because. Uh, this is with another link. 
Yes. I need to give it to you one moment. Okay. So I invite you please to go to the link that I've shared in the chat for this third question. And we can see we have already more. Oh, we have 40 <laughs> replies okay. it. Hey, hey. So one can see the, the green the green column has risen considerably, so no clue about it. Welcome. This is uh, where you will get uh, a hint of what is community-led local develop development and the leader approach. I know a lot. I must say we have quite a few experts and quite a few people who know a lot. And this will be really great for the breakout rooms because that's where we can get together with the people who know a lot, who are an expert about this. Impressive. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I suggest now with this knowledge of who is in the room, because I can see that most people have actually added their institution and also the country where they're from. And I ask you to do this if, if you haven't done so, just so we get a feeling who is in the room. I suggest with this to really start uh, with the theory session. So we, we've learned EU Green Deal. There is quite some basic knowledge. Um, C CLLD, community-led local development as a method of the EU, less knowledge. So I'd ask really Laurence Graff as the first speaker. Laurence is um, with the Directorate General CLIMA. So DG CLIMA is the acronym and Directorate General means it's a part of the European Commission. Laurence Graff is the advisor for the EU Climate Pact. And this is, uh, to my knowledge, the first time the EU Climate Pact that the EU Commission reaches out in a big in a big scale to citizens and communities because Laurence and you will confirm this the European Commission realized hey we can't bring the EU green deal to local levels ourselves so we need citizens and communities and Laurence I invite you to share your presentation or ask uh, us to share it whatever you would like to do I I can share the presentation and, and move around or whatever he, he needs I, I don't think sorry uh no just oh. to say i don't i don't have a presentation so i think i will i will just you know talk that's, about uh, that that's perfect laurence yes just one second laurence before that uh we have an important message on on the chat about the interpretation so please if you need interpretation look at the chat and uh mm -hmm. it is it's, it's explained how to do it okay so over to you graph Thank you and, and good morning everybody and uh, first of all uh, just let me thank you for organizing this event uh, and, uh, and for inviting uh, me to participate. I think it's a very very interesting and challenging topic that is really at the heart of, of the of what we're trying to do at the EU level. So the more we can we can interact with one another, I think the better. So uh, let me start with that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very a brief sort of hint at, uh, at what, what is happening at the moment at the EU level with the, with the Green Deal. So what is, what is at stake there? I, I, I've seen that there, are, there is quite a bit of knowledge on the Green Deal. So I'll be short about that. Uh, but basically, the Green Deal is a very, very broad agenda trying to address climate and many other environmental issues. Uh, obviously, climate is at the heart of it because one of the main objectives is to increase the, uh, the level of climate ambition that we want to achieve by 2030. You know that we had previously agreed on minus 40 uh, in terms of greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction. Now we need to reach 
at least minus 55, which is now enshrined in the climate law, uh, in order to be on track to carbon neutrality by 2050. So I think we're very much, you know, uh, using science, the latest climate science, uh, to consider uh, the level of ambition that we need to have to get there by uh, the middle of the century. So that's at the heart of, of the of, of the Green Deal. And linked to this, uh, of course, we have, uh, you know, enhanced ambition also on the side of energy in terms of renewables, in terms of energy efficiency. And I would say, sadly, but even more so these days in view of the new geopolitical situation. And you may have seen that the Commission came up last week with what we call the Repower EU. So uh, an increased sense of uh, ambition and urgency on the side of renewables, on the side of energy efficiency, on the side of energy savings uh, to accelerate the, the clean energy transition to uh, to do more in terms of uh, of energy savings, to boost the renovation wave, uh, to boost the solar energy, also on top of the gains in terms of, of climate and in terms of saving money, also to move away from our reliance on, on, on imports from, from Russia, as, as you know. So that, that's the two pillars, but, but there are many more because uh, climate is also about mobility. So it's about transport, uh, it's about taxation, energy taxation, it's about agriculture, and we have the farm to fork uh, initiative. And of course, it's about environment as well, because many, many climate and, and environment issues are, are interlinked. So it's about by biodiversity, it's about uh, pollution, it's about the circular economy. So the Green Deal is, is really a massive sort of project uh, um, backed up by a number of, uh, quite a, an impressive number of legislative proposals uh, that ultimately would allow for, you know, the EU objectives agreed upon at political level to be translated into law. Uh, and to constitute the EU enabling framework. Of course, to be implemented at national, regional, local level. So that's, uh, but, but for that you need EU objectives and, and the right sort of uh, enabling, enabling framework. The uh, negotiations are going on, as you know, uh, very heavy, very intensive, uh, intensive in between now uh, the parliament and the council. We hope, let's cross fingers, that irrespective of the of the geopolitical situation and the economic situation that is uh, also uh, um, coming from that, uh, this will move as quickly as possible. There is a great deal of work being done in the two institutions and political support to go as quickly as possible. In, a, in an integrated manner, because it's a big package and uh, you, we need to be in the position to see at the end of the day, throughout the negotiations, that the level of ambition is, is kept. So that's, that's the challenge. Now, the sooner we, we can we get prepared to it, the sooner we start implementing it uh, at, uh, at uh, national, regional, local level, the better. And for that, we obviously need everybody on board. Uh, we need the policymakers at all uh, the levels, the national and the subnational level. And we also need citizens to support, you know, uh, maximum mission and, and to support the transition. Because let's, you know, we're all really convinced about the challenge, but some are a bit less, so we need to be sure that there is no one left behind and that we can accompany the transition and make sure that you, uh, uh, at the end of the day, the transition is well prepared. Uh, but we definitely need committed and ambitious citizens willing to embrace the transition. Uh, we know even if we had the best local or regional actions, we know it would not be enough. We know even if citizens are extremely, you know, uh, determined to, to take action, we know it's not enough. We know we need systemic changes, hence the, uh, the importance of the Green Deal at, at European level. But we are definitely convinced 
even you know more than ever, as Nina said, that local action can send extremely powerful signals to business, uh, you know, as consumers, to policymakers at various levels, uh, local, uh, regional, uh, national level, about legitimate expectations from citizens. I think local action also means for me. Uh, and I've seen that in the slides, and rightly so, it means uh, strong climate or environmental advocacy. I mean, it's about conveying your expectations in terms of policy making, in terms of support mechanism that you need at various levels, uh, including, of course, at European level. And it's also about the best interaction between the EU, the best articulation, I would say, between the EU level, the national, and 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 the uh, the subnational levels. So against that, and along with the uh, the uh, the various legislative proposals that, that have been put forward by the Commission to uh, translate the Green Deal into into law, from the very beginning, this Commission decided that time had come to interact directly with citizens. So that was the, the spirit in which the climate pact was put forward in order basically to increase, to contribute. I mean, we're not the only ones doing that, but we also wanted to, to come with our own contribution to increase uh, awareness on, on climate and environmental issues uh, through direct act interactions with citizens and stakeholders, foster uh, climate action on, on the ground uh, be it from citizens, be it from stakeholders, be it from business, cities, regions. So that's, you know, what we, we, we are interacting with. Uh, and also by the same organ to contribute to the development of a strong sort of uh, climate uh, network. And you are uh, an extremely uh, good example of all of that. So that's what we, we, we want to do also through the Climate Pact. We have a number of tools under the Climate Pact, like the Climate Pact ambassadors uh, that you know, are precisely uh, supposed to, to spur climate action, to, uh, to diffuse uh, information about climate as well. We have, uh, we're trying to support climate action uh, at different levels as well. We're trying to do more in terms of citizens engagement. So we, we, we have tools to go for peer parliament sessions. We have a number of uh, um, citizens dialogues as well in, in all the member states that we do together with our colleagues from, uh, from uh, RTD. So basically um, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that indeed not all will come from, from the EU level, obviously. Uh, traditionally, we interact more with states and authorities at national level, level but we're definitely convinced that as, as we move ahead on, on, on further climate ambition, climate ambition, because you know it's dictated by science, and the more science we have, the more we know we need to be ambitious and, and quick. Uh, as we move ahead on that, the more we need to interact with citizens and to try all together to reflect collectively on, on how best to, uh, to support one another. So that's that's the sort of positive message I wanted to convey at the beginning of this of this meeting, because we have a lot to learn from from one another. Mm -hmm. Over uh, to you. Th yeah, thank you, Laurence, for this. Um, the, can you can you give us a few leverage points apart from the EU climate pact where you see that the EU Green Deal can uh, be implemented on local levels and where can the EU have you know uh, um, an influence on this because it's clear that uh, my village won't listen or won't even know for now they don't even know about the EU Green Deal. But um, can you give us a few examples, you know, where can the EU Commission or the EU Green Deal, the EU level impact at all on local levels? Are there leverage points? Well, there are many, many points, I suppose, because, you know, uh, when uh, we will come to the implementation of the Green Deal, 
probably, you know, uh, there will be a number of, of legislation that will be uh, sort of harmonized at EU level, but also being translated by objectives by member states. And, you know, there is a, a level of differentiation within the EU because we're not asking all member states the same level of effort. So once this will be settled, member states will have to be very, very active on a number of key policies. And that's clear on, on, on climate in general, but that's very clear on, on energy. And, and a lot, and, and we know that uh, already now, because it's already there uh, on the basis of the existing legislation, but a lot will need to be done, for instance, on uh, just taking examples on, on, on buildings, uh, the renovation of buildings, we, because we know that there is a lot of energy savings that can be achieved from uh, renovating buildings. So it's it's really, you know, that's the link with the local level because a lot of decisions are taken in that respect also at the local level. Uh, most of them supported by national schemes or support mechanisms, but, but decisions are very much uh, taken there. In terms of um, energy, uh, energy supplies or energy savings, a lot can also be done at, at, at local level. Uh, so, and that will come from the objectives that will then be agreed at, at EU level. We're not there yet, but this can be anticipated. And more that can be done right now, the more better the member states and the local level will be. Uh, so that these are a few a few examples of you know linkages between between what is about to be agreed at EU level and then what's going to come at at local level. It, it, it of course, it depends on member states and how member states are being organized in between national action and then sub-national actions. And that is very different from one member state to another uh, for historical reasons. But, uh, but all will have a lot on their plate. Uh, energy is just one example. But if you take transport, for instance, and we know there is also much more to be done on the side of transport. Uh, in terms of public transport, in, ter in terms of uh, multimodal uh, shift uh, uh, on, on the transport side, I think that will also require a lot of discussions between the local, regional and the national levels in the same way. So that, that is all uh, coming with the EU coming on top because there are many inter sort of uh, uh, or regional uh, European uh, dimensions in there, where and also in terms of infrastructure, where the EU will come and will support, you know, uh, the uh, the new decisions and the new uh, initiatives to be taken. Say, for instance, on on trains. Uh, so that these are two, you know, striking mm -hmm. examples, I would say. Yeah, thank you very much. There was just a question in the chat, if uh, we can ask uh, questions to you, Laurence. Uh, will you sure. be able to stay for the networking session? Would you be able to stay until that's 12.20 to 1 p.m.? Yes? Wonderful. So we can uh, ask Laurence uh, questions in the networking sessions, and we will also have a short Q&A after this theory block. I call it um, because uh, um, thank you, Laurence, for this introduction into the EU Green Deal and the EU Climate Pact and how the EU Green Deal with its binding targets, so the EU climate law, it's a binding target on EU level, the EU nature restoration law, which will hopefully come through, will have binding targets. So this is the trickle down mechanism. And yeah. I would like to announce now the next next speaker, because um, local levels, Laurence, you said they are there to prepare. So it's kind of an anti anticipation mode. They can see the EU Green Deal. They can see there is something coming and they can prepare. And also there are proven methods of bringing down um, EU policies and EU funding to local levels. And this is now we've come to the acronym, which is community led local development and the leader approach. And we have Hartmut Bernd here, who is vice president of ELAD, who is the association that groups 
2,500 of the local action groups. There are 3,000 in Europe, or I think it's over 3,000, and ELAD groups more than 2,500, if I'm right. Hartmut is vice president of ELAD, and ELAD is also a partner in this event because Ecolis and ELAD, uh, we think community led initiatives, this is Ecolis and local action groups, this is ELAD, they fit together very well to anticipate this EU Green Deal and to start implementing it from the ground, which I'm sure Hartmut will tell us they already do. <laughs> so Hartmut, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Nina, for introducing me. And I try to uh, share my screen. Okay, I hope you can see it now, everybody. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Um, yes, and I, I will just start because the uh, time is short and I would really like to start somewhat emotionally uh, when I try to explain leader and CLD. And uh, I would uh, try to start with uh, what is the heart of leader and CLD? And for me, there's no doubt the heart of leader and of CLD is the bottom up approach. And uh, what is behind this uh, enthusiasm for, for this bottom-up approach? I am really and deeply convinced that uh, the people themselves know best about their needs and the needs of their rural areas. And uh, I'm really thankful that the EU recognized this when LIDA was started 30 years ago. And this means with LIDA, uh, the EU supports the implementation of people's ideas under the EU cohesion policy, aiming at viable, resilient, and, and that's the uh, issue today, sustainable rural areas and sustainable areas. For me, the bottom-up approach is the most important aspect of LEADER and CLAD. But of course, there are some more characteristics of, of this approach. And this is, uh, I would like to say this on the, on the second uh, point at the list, the area-based uh, approach. That they are behind the local activities, there's a area-based local development strategy. It's a local public-private partnership and heart of this is the local action group. I will tell a little bit more about this later. And that means it's a it's integrated, a multi-sectoral action. Uh, there are people from all sectors who come together and cooperate, network, and try to find new combined innovation projects. That's behind the leader approach and somewhat behind CLLD. The key role in LIDA is uh, plays the local action group. And most important is that the lack, the local action group should reflect the local population. And the task of the LACs uh, is that they elaborate and implement the local development strategies. They specify funding conditions like funding rate and who is, could be beneficiaries. They initiate and select projects. They initiate and organize multi-sectoral cooperation and networking, and they foster capacity building and trans-regional um, cooperation. With this, uh, print, following these principles, uh, LEADER, I think, is somewhat a success story, and Nina already told us that there are about 3,000 lakhs uh, now, and they are covering around 61% of the rural population in the EU. And the public expenditure, uh, expenditure is about 10 billion euro, from which uh, 7 billion are from the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development. So what is now the impact of this, of LEADER and of the money spent on this? And uh, there are 
I think are thousands of evaluation papers about leader, but there's a very new one, and this is called Evaluation Support Study on the Impact of Leader on Balanced Territorial Development. And I, I'd like to quote only two aspects from the abstract. And the first one is, they say the study found leader was relevant and effective for local rural development, targeting and achieving economic development, strengthening social fabric and capacity, and enhancing local governance with good coherence alongside other policies. I think this is very positive, but there's a, a little uh, hint on uh, what's going on with uh, environmental goals, and it is environmental goals were less frequently the main focus of LAC's activities and projects. But I have to comment this because we, we should always be aware that the, um, the leader or the CLAD uh, approaches um, cover a very, very broad spectrum of aspects in rural development or with CLAD in also in, in urban areas. And uh, it must be clear that they are area-based. That means they uh, sh should take into account the specificities of each region. It would be a mistake to focus only on one aspect. But what now is the effect on uh, the subject, the issue we are talking about today? And this is um, the environmental one. And uh, I think they are already presented, but what are the main en environmental challenges we, we have to, to face? Of course, it is the climate change, but also it's the decreasing bio biodiversity the harmful waste and, and pollution. And uh, I would like to say that on the first, uh, on, the, on the fourth, the consumption of resources. I think it's, it's impossible to, uh, to give an overview on how many projects in Europe, leader projects face these problems, these issues. So I will uh, only try to give you a, a short view on what is done in only my, in one, in one leader, uh, in, in one lag. And I would like to do this with, with this picture, which shows very broad spectrum already and a wide field of actions. And in my lag until now in the last years, there are more than 35 projects uh, with the objective of environmental issues. And I'm really sure that environmental action on local level, level uh, addresses all environmental challenges. How can leader now contribute to, to these problems we have to face? Um, I think it's too long to go uh, to, to any of these aspects, but I, I would like to um, concentrate on, on this one. I think the, the, the very most important aspect of CLLD and LEADER is that it gives local people the chance, the chance to identify with environmental uh, projects and their goals they make the projects and the goals their own. And it's very, very important uh, for, for future change. And to give a conclusion is that my experience, and that is 20 years of working with LIDA here in my region, that there are a lot of people in rural areas who want to play an active role in shaping a sustainable future of their habitat and are willing to work voluntarily for this goal, a lot of people. And I think participation is a very important key for a successful transformation towards sustainability. I will show this in a, in a practical example later. But I think we all have to be aware that New legal and political frameworks are crucial requirements for supporting local engagement and for giving the possibility to upscale those examples. 
And the second one, and I think uh, Lawrence already uh, told us about that, the local level can only be one level of action. Very fundamental political decisions are needed on all levels for successful transformation on long term. Yes, and with this, I say thank you to you all for listening. Uh, thank you, Hartmut. Um, so Hartmut Bernd uh, of ELA just explained the approach of uh, leader and community-led local development. And we had a question of, uh, uh, it was Peter Hageroth, uh, Tra Transition Jarna, Sweden, saying, uh, first of all, congratulations to Peter. Uh, you've just looked up your local LAG, local action group. That's the first step. <laughs> the second step is, and that you point out it there, we have five commun uh, communal politicians, five from farm business, five from tourism, sports, business, church, no one from environment organizations. A, a, a commune politician since 30 plus years represents the NGO sector, not so much bottom up, is it? Um, this is an interesting, interesting question. And uh, Hartmut, what would you say about that? I'm sure you come across this a lot. Yes, uh, but I have to say not in my own region, uh, because in my own region, it's, I don't know how this developed. <laughs> I have been a partner of the LAC from the beginning on as a representative of an environmental organization. And there were a lot. I think the environmental associations are the, the greatest group in our lag. Mm -hmm. So um, the lags are very different, but the lags should be and have to be open, open, open to everybody. And we in Germany try to motivate these environmental associations and organizations to, to participate to uh, ask to be part of, of the LACs and uh, to decide about strategy and projects. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hartmut. We will also have a good practice example later by Nara Petrovic, uh, which explains how you know citizens kind of sense that their existing LAC was not doing what they felt was right. I hope I'm explaining this right, Nara. And um, they joined and they actually joined the local action group. So if you don't like what's happening, join uh, and make it better. That's a possibility. And um, thank you so much, uh, Hartmut. So what's happening here, we had Laurence Graff about the EU Green Deal, which is here. And we have local action groups, which are uh, bottom up. And I, there is a phrase, you know, top down, pot, bottom up. <laughs> and it's really not a nice phrase. It's really a weird phrase, right? And I asked a friend and she came up with the word capillary action. You know, trees, they have capillars and that's how they connect roots and the treetop. And I like to think of what should and could and will probably happen as a capillary action between the roots the bottom up and the treetop because, and that's something Hartmut mentioned, we now have the chance of the right political framework with the EU Green Deal and it is a paradigm change. So this is a, a unique chance. Having said this, um, thank you Hartmut for your presentation. And I will now lead over to Eamon O'Hara, who is the founder of Ecolise and development director of Ecolise. And this capillary action, the roots, so the local action, is really what Ecolise re represents. It's grassroots action. And Eamon uh, will tell us about why Eamon personally also thinks that community-led initiatives, Ecolise, and local action groups, the ELAT, LEADER, CLLD approach are a good match. Nothing is perfect in life, but I think Eamon thinks they are a good match. Eamon, so over to you. Thank you very much, Nina. Uh, if I could ask one, maybe to help me with the slides. Yes, thanks very much, Juan. You can go to the second slide. Yeah, so I, I suppose I'd just like to start maybe the presentation with just reminding ourselves that we're in an emergency. 
we're in a, a climate and ecological emergency. And I think this is creating, I would say, a lot of anxiety generally among citizens within communities. Um, there's also a sense that the policy, uh, the policy framework is, is shifting and a lot of big ambitions are coming forward in terms of policy expectations. So I think this also creates, creates a, lot, a lot of stresses in the system. And I think there's anxiety with, within communities about what this means for people and, and their local communities. Um, and I think this is something we need to address. I think it, it creates risks and challenges, but also potentially it creates opportunities as well. Um, and a big challenge I'd, I'd see for communities going forward is how do communities navigate these changes? We're in a time now of, of I would say quite immense change. How are communities going to navigate these changes in, in the future years, particularly over the next five to 10 years? And I think if we're serious about citizen engagement in this process uh, and about just transition, about inclusive processes, then really we need transition processes in, in every community. We need these processes at a, at a level where they're close to people, close to citizens, where it's meaningful for people. So I think really what we need is, is structured, facilitated transition processes in every community. And this really starts with, with conversations, spaces where people can express their concerns and anxieties, but also channel these into something more constructive and more positive. Um, and I think communities need support with this going forward. Uh, next slide, please, one. So what, what can we do about this? Well, uh, I think this is a good time to introduce Ecolise because Ecolise is very much about supporting community-led responses to the climate and ecological emergency. And the Ecolise members, we have 46, uh, I think the latest is 47 member organizations now. Uh, and the work of these organizations is on supporting many thousands of pioneering communities that are already engaged in this transition process across Europe. So in some ways, these are kind of lighthouse examples of what direction we could go in terms of bringing the European Green Deal down to the local level. How, how can we engage citizens and what can we do collectively at this level that's meaningful uh, at the local level, but also contributes to higher level ambition and higher level goals? And Ecolise members, I guess, are supporting communities, pioneering communities in this work. But at the same time, we, we have members who are also learning from these activities and sharing this experience through demonstration, outreach, and educational activities. So we, we see this as potentially a, a very important resource in terms of how we can learn from this and, and scale up as we go forward and try and achieve higher levels of ambition. Next slide, please, one. So one of our initiatives, our, our main initiative really in terms of achieving this is Communities for Future. Um, and Communities for Future is really a, a call to action, the communities. So it's a call for engagement. And at the same time, it's a, it's a space for collaboration between Ecolise and other partners. And I think what, what this, I suppose, reflects is the need for bigger impact now. And I think in order to achieve bigger impact, we really need to start connecting the dots. I think everything that, that we need in order to achieve this bigger impact is there. The ingredients are there, but they're not necessarily in connection and, and linking together in the right ways. So Communities for Future is, I guess, what we see as a space to allow for these connections to take place, to connect the dots and work towards more widespread mainstreaming of regenerative and transformative community-led action on climate change and sustainability. And one very important partner we see in this process is the CLLD community and CLLD stakeholders. Uh, and we see this as, as, you know, this relationship has been very important in terms of communities for future. Next slide, please, one. So in, in the context of Communities for Future, particularly working together with CLD, um, we see an opportunity to work together to support community-led and a just transition. Um, and 
I mentioned earlier about the need for, for transition processes at community level. What might this look like? What might this involve? Well, I think this needs to start in most communities with a conversation or with conversations um, where I, I think where we can already get into discussions, awareness raising uh, about what's happening, uh, about the different factors that are feeding in to these broader, these global scale challenges, but also into conversations about what people can do locally. Uh, and that's locally within their community, but also individually within their own lives. And it's not, it's not just about projects. I think it's more than projects because this is more systemic. Um, a local renewable energy project is important, but that in its own is not enough because the ecological and, and the climate emergency affect all aspects of our lives. And this is already mentioned and alluded to. It's, it's about food, it's about mobility, uh, it's about individual behavior. So it's, it's a more systemic issue. And I think the, this conversation needs to be brought down to the local level. But it's also about sharing ideas and inspiration because one of the things we hear is communities, people locally want to do something, but they don't know what to do or what they can do. So we need to share ideas. There are plenty of ideas. There's plenty of inspiration out there. We need to share these more, more widely. Uh, and then we need to improve access to resources. Uh, and when I say resources, I mean funding, but also knowledge, expertise. Uh, there's other things that, that communities need in order to be able to have these conversations, but also maybe move from conversation and awareness to action. Uh, and this is especially, I think, where ECHLEs, Communities for Future, and CLLD stakeholders can work together more effectively. Okay, I'll stop there, Nina. So back to you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Eamon, for this. Um, and um, actually, I just wrote in the chat that we have a space for one question before we go on to hear about the good practice examples. And um, if there is a question in the chat, um, I think we have space for one question because we have like two minutes, so it's really short space. So if there are no questions, that's fine as well. There will be room for question and answer and networking uh, in the networking session at 12.20. And uh, we will have all the speakers, uh, apart from um, Carlos Alberto Ortiz, who will present a good practice example later. So you can also gather your questions now and ask them later. So I suggest just to... Um, take a mental break in the sense that we have a small um, a small pause now that we take some time just to reflect what we've just heard and maybe also have another look around in the room because we're now 77 participants and there are many people probably in the room whom you would like to get to know So we've heard from Eamon um, the necessity also for um, transition on the ground. And before we go on to the good practice examples, which come from first from Ecolis members, we have two good practice examples, and then we will show two good practice examples from the ELAD membership, so the local action groups. and. Um, what Eamon mentioned is that there are uh, grassroots initiatives. And for me personally, I just wanted to add this. It's also what Ecolis members offer is a vision of the good life, which does not have to do with material wealth, with uh, high GDP, with getting bigger every year. That's not what, <laughs> what, what I want to personally. I don't want to put on weight every year. so. This vision of a good life is really what is also within Ecolise's membership. And it is one of the scientific findings that we need people to disconnect from the thought that a uh, good life is about spending money. A uh, good life can be other things and other values. And if you look at Ecolise members, then you will find some inspiration there as well. And with this, Eamon also said that um, local action groups, for example, ELAD members, need inspiration. 
some local action group uh, groups like uh, Hartmut's local action group in Göttingen seems to be doing fine. There's a lot of inspiration, but we have a member here of Ecolis, which is Davy um, Philip from Sustainable Ireland. And um, Davy will now introduce us to his ideas about how to give communities ideas. Hey, what can we do in the realm of climate action? So Davy, over to you. Thanks, Nina. Um, can you hear me and see my screen okay, my presentation? Yes. Okay, yes. so I'm Davy Philip. I was a council member and president of Ecolis over the last six years. I'm based in rural Ireland in a sustainable community, and I've been working on sustainable communities since the late 90s. I'm going to introduce a project that's a consortium of NGOs, Cultivate uh, ESD Training and Clock Jordan Eco Village, which is a national e NGO. Uh, I'm going to introduce a project we've been doing with local development companies called Communities for Climate Action. So we were invited by County Kildare uh, leader, uh, the local development company, uh, to apply to a tender to design and deliver a course to citizens, to local groups and clubs, and um, to help them imagine what might be possible for projects that could be funded by leader. Leader in certain areas in Ireland were experiencing uh, a lack of uh, applications for funding that was allocated to environmental uh, projects. And this was happening in a number of places. So we came together and we um, delivered, designed and delivered uh, this module that I'm going to introduce. Um, we've also now successfully delivered the, the module for County Wexford Local Development Company, the leader company there. Uh, which was held virtually due to the pandemic restrictions. And with Brefni Integrated CLG, that's the Cavan, County Cavan uh, Community Development Company, we've um, worked with them to deliver three courses, two held physically and one held virtually. So these Communities for Climate Action um, programs are held on behalf of local development companies to really help community groups understand the climate and ecological challenge and how they might start to mitigate and reduce their carbon emissions, but also, and most importantly, how they can come more resilient, uh, how they can adapt to the climate challenge and progress community-led initiatives that would be eligible for leader funding. And you can see some pictures there of the different approaches we take. It's a dynamic course, uh, which includes a launch a town hall launch event with TV celebrities to try and uh, communicate and attract um, the mainstream citizens. We have an online learning environment we use just using Google Classroom with resources and papers and videos. Uh, we have a full day introduction where we go to the community and work with them um, on different aspects and quite dynamically. And then we have six modules delivered now mostly in person, but during the pandemic, a few times we held on Zoom and virtual whiteboards. And those modules start with climate action, uh, really getting an understanding, raising ambitions for action, uh, community resilience, how we think about our local economies in this and the sort of projects that could help our communities thrive in these uncertain times. Managing energy and transport uh, is a big module. Water and climate change, uh, then zero waste in the circular economy, and then local food and sustainable land use. Each of these modules uh, brings in a local expert, either the community water officer or the climate um, officer for that region, uh, which we do have now in place in some regions, but also our sustainable community mentors, which every region has. The big highlight, I think, of this course is a day-long field trip to Clock Jordan Eco Village, where I'm based, to see different environmental and sustainable projects, some funded by LEADER, in person. So this site visit is a, a real a highlight of the module. Um, we, the people spend the day here, get a taste of Clock Jordan, walk around, see uh, different projects, um, and get a sense of what can be done. These are just 
some of the materials that we use to promote our, our courses. This one's from Cavan, which we're just finishing the last of three um, full modules from Cavan uh, County Local Development Company. Now, what we do in each county is we leave a C4CA, a Communities for Climate Action group, um, that now acts as a local group and, and keeps these conversations going in their local areas. And with the three courses in Cavan next month, uh, we're gonna bring those together, those three different courses, so that there's a strong Communities for Climate Action group in Cavan after the module. Now, for facilitating community-led climate action, we're really going to build a need to build the competencies of local facilitators, community mentors, animators across Europe. And I'm involved in an exciting Erasmus funded project of six Ecolease members, which includes uh, the Finnish Leader Network uh, to support, to train, support, and enable uh, community climate coaches, these catalysts in local places that can work with local uh, communities, be trained up to really hold um, social dialogue and uh, interventions with the, with the local place to, to develop climate resilience plans and to tap in to other initiatives that are happening uh, nationally and at the European level uh, at that local level. And then just recently with two local development companies in County Tipperary, which is in the middle of Ireland, and the Tipperary Public Participation Network, another thing Ireland have got in every county to bring cohesion between all the voluntary and um, local uh, groups. Uh, we put a proposal to the Irish government's Community Climate Action Fund to pilot a local version of this community climate coach project being developed uh, training pilot will be piloted later this year and in March next year we'll have resources, competency frameworks, toolkits and training for a new vocation of community climate coaches. And our target is people already working with local development companies, animating local uh, sustainability interventions that are facilitating change locally. So I hope that was a, a little oversight of something that it fits very well with the theme of today, fits very well with bringing the European um, proposals and frameworks like the Green New Deal or the Climate Pact to root it in the local environment and through conversations, the building the capacity of local citizens and really developing projects that can be funded in the new round of leader and in the many other uh, European supports that are coming down to the sub-local level, the community, the neighborhood, the town and the village level. Our crisis is one of imagination. And the citizens, as Eamon says, can uh, imagine what a community-led initiative that would um, respond to the climate emergency would be. So our project really is just to illuminate uh, projects that Ecolease members for over two decades now have been prototyping and developing. And hopefully a project like this can mainstream these ideas, can normalize them and accelerate our journey to sustainable communities across Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Davy. Um, so you just said our crisis is one, a crisis of imagination. So uh, local communities often don't know what to do. If we look at the EU Green Deal, it's very new. So end of 2019 is when it came into existence, really, when the Commission uh, uh, pronounced the plan of the EU Green Deal. So uh, Hartmut Bern said earlier that there is a lot of creativity uh, bottom up, um, but what's lacking is the right political framework. So I think there are two pieces coming together here because in my view, yes, imagination is absolutely, you know, what should the future look like? People have to imagine this, they have to feel it and uh, grassroots level activities and actions and community led initiatives can inspire but also the political framework needs to be right. And um, Davy, one question to you. 
you were involved, you've been involved for a long time in transition network, in eco villages. Why are you focusing on this CLLD slash leader approach? So community led local development leader, which is a method by the EU of channeling funding and also policies like the EU Green Deal upcoming in the new period, which starts next year. Why are you so focused on this? Well, as Hartman mentioned in his presentation, we need bottom up, we need local uh, driven initiatives. And so I feel that to start with something that's got over two decades of experience and orientated towards community led climate action uh, will make sense. I feel that when people hear climate emergency and climate action, um, they get frozen. Uh, and so our opportunity is to show the potential of bottom-up community-led uh, development that can actually help us mitigate or adapt to the threat of climate change. And of course, at the same time, build our resilience, restore our ecosystems, regenerate our communities, uh, really taking a regenerative and a resilience approach to a sustainable community. So I do think building on the experience uh, of leader and this approach is really important, um, especially for the leader, the Ecolease members, the sort of networks across Europe that have been on the margins for so long that we can bring these approaches, normalize, mainstream, accelerate them uh, into society, how we feed ourselves, house ourselves in a different approach to the market approach or a developer led approach. And there's so many rich ideas out there that are exciting that people could get behind. And most importantly, make uh, proposals for leader funding and, and, and make sure that that funding is spent uh, in the direction that the Green Deal uh, and the Climate Pact is telling us we need to go. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Davy. Thank you for this presentation. And that was a very good, you know, bridge also to the next presentation, because you said, make sure as a community that the money that is there because leader and the community led local development approach they channel eu funds and they are in theory your local action group could be able to access a lot of funds give you expertise on how to do it so that's that's their role but communities are in a responsibility to also take possession of their local action group that sounds now a bit violent but Nara Petrovic um, you will explain how this uh, happened actually in Istria Slovenia where where you were based uh, Nara Petrovic of Sunny Hill Slovenia Sunny Hill is an eco village in Slovenia so Nara what happened it's as I understand it in the period of 2014 to 2017 or 21, that you and uh, other citizens managed to take over a local action group and make it work better. So not perfect again, but make it work better. Nara, over to you. Uh, thank you. I'm really happy to see here some people from Slovenia as well, and uh, some people from the networks I know. So it's great to engage in this space of uh, discussing local action groups and CLLD program. Uh, so I'll tell a story from uh, bottom-up uh, engagement of very disengaged uh, residents of rural areas in uh, Slovenia and Istria, which consists of four municipalities. And um, I'm, so, I'm sorry they're not here to present the story also from first-person uh, perspective of the last years especially. So I will focus mostly on um, this development of bottom-up initiative uh, in Istria. So there were many problems that people identified. Uh, they were disengaged because of you know, coming to the meetings and seeing all the conditions for you to receive funding, waiting two years to get the money, uh, having to have employees for this very little money that you get, like 20,000 euros, and you have to keep somebody employed for a couple of years. So people were like, no, we don't want to be investing so much time and energy into all the bureaucracy and all the stuff that is connected to local action um, group. So, uh, but the new period was coming and the strategy of local development was being formed. So uh, there were a few people in the region, uh, specifically Dane Podmenik, he was the, like, the central figure, uh, former student, local, um, creating his own uh, eco farm in a region that has been increasing 
eco farming. And he gathered around uh, him a couple of people who then became the uh, core team. We would go, okay, I'll start my screen share just so you see a few slides. Um, okay, just a second. Um, so we actually engaged with the EEA funding mechanism. Some of you maybe know it, it's the Norwegian fund sometimes uh, called. So that's how we got the initial funding of uh, some 20,000 euros. It wasn't much, but it was enough to keep us going uh, and reaching out to uh, really villages, local communities, getting to the people, uh, organizing events in their own environment and um, inviting them through a facilitated process to feed into a uh, local strategy. And that's, that's how we arrived to three main topics, which were rural development, tourism, and nature preservation. We identified conflicts between these two uh, three teams and how to resolve them. So that was basically uh, what we um, managed to accomplish by engaging maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20 local communities in their own environment. And then uh, we wrapped it all up through uh, Eastrian rural parliament. It was, I think, first the first rural parliament originally done by that by that time. Maybe there are other rural parliaments taking place uh, currently in Europe, but you know, as far as I know, it was the first regional one where we summed up results and kind of said, "Yeah, this is what we, as inhabitants of the region, uh, sign up to." In this way, a consortium of NGOs was formed which was, let's say, it, like we were a parallel local action group. We were not official, but when we appeared on the local action group um, forming meeting for the next period of seven years, we were the majority. So we could really uh, bring in the voice of the uh, region there. We also voted for what we thought was the most competent uh, director. And uh, since then, there were ups and downs, of course, but uh, the local action group, including the fisheries, the FLAG, is functioning many, many times better than it used to in the past. And uh, I see that we have local action group Istria and uh, no, uh, Burkini and Kras. So they're our neighboring local action group. And from what I know, there are some collaborations between them too, and also with Italian neighboring LAGs and Croatian ones. So this is a bit of a story of the background. And inside Ecolis, we are partnering with um, other organizations in Europe through various projects. So we are just now running Erasmus Plus Eco Village Transition in Action Program. So I'm talking to you from Scotland, where we're just meeting and discussing how to uh, connect local authorities with community-led uh, initiatives that are working locally and how to bring uh, increased capacity on both sides so that local authorities can speak with, uh, with community-led initiatives and vice versa. And in this way, we hope that these five points that are on the screen that we can ensure uh, these things work, can work better. So we have a smarter CLLD support to local action groups and local initiatives, that we have a better reward for uh, wide participation. So what I mean by that is, we have scattered local communities that are disengaged, so how to bring them in and uh, reward them for their engagement instead of uh, having them struggle. How to share practical know-how. So what I'm sharing with you is just a little glimpse. I hope we can touch upon more of that in the, uh, in the breakout session later on. One thing that I bring up always with uh, when we talk with European Commission and others is lean administration, so less bureaucracy and how we can, through social innovation, address all the climate change issues and, uh, and attach all this to a Green New Deal in a systemic way uh, on European level. So these are a few topics um, I touched upon, and I would just like to share one little thing lastly. So we are hosting in Brussels. So if you are, uh, if you are <laughs> uh, right now in Brussels, um, we would like to invite you, I would like to invite you to an event that we're holding in Brussels. And okay, how do I stop sharing the screen now? Uh, okay, oh, stop share. And I will paste in chat 
Oh, Nina, you already pasted it. Thank you. So this is an event. Uh, feel free to register. We'll have some people from uh, Good Collaborations present there. And we are happy also to hear your voice and engage you to, to upscale it uh, in Belgium. So yeah, hope to see you there. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you, Nara, for this presentation. Um, so this was a, a, an example how, of how a regional development strategy can be influenced by citizens, because the question came up by uh, Peter Hageroth before. My luck seems to be, you know, there seems to be no environmental organization. What do I do? The answer is, you know, get involved, call them, contact them, meet them and discuss and, and you will see uh, um, there might be amazing openness uh, or there might not. And then you can follow Nara Petrovic's path and organize, get organized. Um, thank you so much, Nara, for this presentation. And now I would like to lead over to it's I mean, it's similar presentations. We have done a little differentiation between community led initiatives cooperating with local action groups. And now we come to local up action groups cooperating with community led initiatives. So it's a nuance. And I invite um, Carlos Alberto Ortiz, who is of Mancha Norte in Spain. He is uh, a mayor of uh, Pedro Moniz. I hope I say, I say all oh, this yes. right. I don't. <laughs> Carlos Alberto, um, the floor is yours. And Carlos Alberto will tell us about a biodiversity project in Spain, which is called La Mancha Humeda. And Carlos will be translated, I think, is that so, by Lucia. So go ahead. Bienvenido, Carlos, cuando quieras. Vale. El proyecto de, de la Reserva de la Biosfera de la Mancha Húmeda es un proyecto de cooperación que está encuadrado dentro de la programación líder. Es un proyecto que lo, la dificultad que engloba es que se han unido seis grupos de acción local, por lo tanto, seis comarcas de las distintas zonas de la Mancha. Los grupos son Mancha Norte, Alto Guadiana, eh, Don Quijote, Dulcinea, Zancara y Sacar. Tenemos una extensión de 418.000 hectáreas y la dificultad que componen que este proyecto vaya englobado por más de 30 municipios. ¿Por qué surge este proyecto? Pues este proyecto surge porque teníamos en esta zona de La Mancha un grave desconocimiento de lo que es una reserva de la biosfera. Teníamos también un problema en el tema del agua, pero sobre todo teníamos pensamientos negativos de la población local sobre la conservación de los espacios naturales, sobre todo los agricultores. Y también había un gran desconocimiento de las oportunidades que brinda, que brinda ser la figura de la reserva de la biosfera. Este proyecto se inicia en el año 2019, pero debido a la pandemia del COVID sufre un parón y lo estamos actualizando, lo estamos realizando ahora. Va a tener una duración de 30 meses y el objetivo general es que la, los ciudadanos que vivimos en esta reserva lo veamos como una oportunidad y no como una amenaza al territorio. Los objetivos específicos que engloban este proyecto es crear una idea fuerza para el territorio, conseguir la participación y la gobernanza en el funcionamiento de la Reserva de la Biosfera, ser un eje articulador de una estrategia de desarrollo inteligente, sobre todo fomentar la educación ambiental empezando desde la escuela, que es la base, empezar desde los jóvenes, fomentar el empleo verde, crear una marca paraguas para todos los actores del territorio y sectores económicos y divulgar el valor del concepto de reserva de la biosfera. Hemos realizado ya diversas acciones, como han sido el diseño de identidad e imagen, tenemos la página web, eh, se han realizado vídeos post promocionales, diferentes spots eh, promocionales dependiendo de la zona 
y haciendo uno general de 4 minutos y 46 y haciendo cortos de un minuto y de dos para que todo el mundo pueda ver las distintas zonas que, de, que son, se van a desarrollar dentro de la biosfera de la mancha húmeda. He hecho también trabajo de consultoría. Se han realizado cuatro eventos de presentación con las distintas administraciones porque este proyecto, hemos oído en proyectos anteriores que pedían colaboración de las administraciones, en este proyecto sí hemos conseguido que la Junta de Comunidades de Castilla-La Mancha esté también con nosotros cooperando. Y se han realizado en Albacete, en Toledo, Ciudad Real y Cuenca, contando con bastantes personas a su presentación. Pero sobre todo lo que hacemos es llevarlo a las aulas para que nuestros pequeños lo puedan conocer. Consideramos que los chicos y las chicas de nuestra comarca deben ser los principales valedores de la misma. Y solo lo pueden realizar si conocen el funcionamiento. Se llevan realizadas 118 charlas, de las que serán 142 las que tenemos que, que, entregar, que realizar. Tenemos también campañas en redes sociales, donde hemos comprometido un año de duración dentro del programa LIDER. Hemos creado y gestionado la marca Reserva de la Biosfera. Queremos ser la voz de los proyectos en las redes sociales y escuchar lo que se dice de nuestra marca en la red. Por último, eh, quería informar de las acciones a realizar. Pues son seis jornadas de participación social en la cual todos los grupos de acción local podemos hacer intercambiar opiniones. Vamos a realizar un viaje a otra reserva de la biosfera, a la marisma coruñesa, para intercambiar también opiniones y a ver en qué podemos mejorar. Se va a realizar un plan estratégico y sobre todo un evento general de conclusiones donde todos los actores que han participado en este proyecto de la reserva intercambiemos opiniones y veamos en qué podemos mejorar para que todos podamos vivir en ella y que sea todo más sostenible. Muchas gracias. Thank you a lot, Carlos Alberto, for this presentation. So, um, what I found interesting is that you pointed out that the people locally did not see a benefit of the biosphere reserve La Mancha Humeda. So, they thought biodiversity is against their interests. Is that it? And how will your project <clears throat> overcome this? Come on. Should I ask it again? So, um, the local people, it Contesto. seems, in, in, in the month. A ver, eh, la gente, sí, eh, perdón, eh, la gente pensaba que, que la, la reserva de la biosfera, lo que son nuestros magníficos humedales, era algo negativo, pues porque los agricultores en principio nos quitaban el agua a los humedales. No podían trabajar con ciertos fertilizantes cerca de los complejos lagunares. No veían la importancia que tiene vivir en una reserva natural y convivir con los animales y sobre todo el daño que le estábamos que le estaban haciendo al ecosistema anteriormente y la defensa que ahora se realiza y sobre todo ahora están empezando a atender lo que es vivir en la reserva de la biosfera y utilizar su marca convivir se puede hacer turismo sostenible podemos estamos creciendo todos los pueblos de las comarcas y se, estamos conviviendo perfectamente tanto con nuestros humedales como con nuestros animales Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So it's about value, giving value to biodiversity also in the eyes of local citizens. Um, thank you very much, Carlos Alberto Ortiz. Um, I know that you have to leave, so I'm very grateful that you found the time to be with us and also to Lucia um, for the great interpretation, for the great translation. And um, we will share also contacts. If somebody has questions to Carlos Alberto, then please contact us and we can share questions that you might have on this project, La Mancha Humeda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think this, the question, you know, of uh, trade-offs is very, very often there. So 
people think that bio, uh, biodiversity environment ¿Me puedo salir? Uh, sí, hemos acabado, Carlos. Qué, qué mental, ¿eh? Carlos, hemos acabado. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Gracias a vosotros. Gracias. Que tengas, que tengas buen día, Carlos. Gracias. 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 So there is a, a trade-off, a perceived trade-off between, you know, uh, my economic and social well-being and uh, caring for the environment. And really, that's a, spe a special thing, I think, about the leader and community-led local development approach, that it in theory has all three legs if one wants to talk about three legs of something so it's economic it's social and it's environmental and uh, any project should ideally stand uh, safe and stable on all of these three legs today we focus on environment on environmental action on, on the eu green deal and hartmut bernd has talked already to us about the leader and cll approach Hartmut is also a local action manager in the Göttinger Land. Göttingen is in the north of Germany, for me as a Bavarian at least. I don't know if you can say it's in the north. <laughs> so Hartmut, uh, which, which creative project uh, can you present uh, to us that has these three legs and puts a focus on environmental action? Over to you, Hartmut. Yeah, thank you, Nina, again for the possibility to present uh, the project Bioenergy Villages in our leader region. And it's some years old, but uh, meanwhile, it has become a blueprint for other projects like uh, uh, developing uh, models for uh, e-car sharing in villages. Uh, so uh, I think it's, it's very actual uh, nowadays. Yes, uh, at first, uh, yes, I, I have to... Share the screen first. At first, I want to to trans, uh, to give you the uh, the opportunity to to come to the to our uh, our site with me to, to have a, a little impression on how we are talk what we are talking about. And this is a, a picture of the first bioenergy village in the in the world. It was Yunde, and you see the, the biogas plant and you see uh, the action there. They are, the farmers are preparing the silage. And in the background, you see a little bit of the village. And with this biogas plant, um, this village is supplied with energy. They produce more electricity than the village needs. And they produce about 70% uh, of the heat which is needed for the house heatings in the village. Uh, and this, uh, this heat is, uh, um, this energy is, is uh, supplied by, from biomass, from the farmers and from, for example, the, the manure of these cows you see here. So that's a very, very close connection. Uh, the basis of uh, implementing this project was that uh, in our strategy, there was a focus on renewable energy and climate protection already at that time. And it keeps to be a focus. And the new one, uh, sustainability is a key word in, in, our, in the title of our new strategy, uh, which is uh, for the next period from 2023. And uh, we talked about that uh, also in the chat. Uh, yes, in our region and our lag, uh, there's a strong group of environmental uh, people. So I want to try. I, I try to to give an explanation of the system of a of a biogas uh, a bioenergy village of this project, and uh, the central is the biogas plant, which is feeded by biomass from the farmers by waste, um, natural waste and manure from the uh, from the cattle. And it's in this fermenters gas is produced, the gas drives an engine, the engine drives a generator and the generator produces electricity. And when we started with the project, at that time, uh, a, a, a big amount of the energy was waste heat because it was not used 40% of the of the energy which was in this material 
was given to the air because nobody used it. And the idea was to change that. And the idea, it was, uh, it, this idea came from the university in Göttingen. The idea was to use it to heat, oops, sorry, to use it to heat the village houses. And this is done with a village heat grid, heat grid which has to be uh, built and brings the energy from the engine to the houses. And for cold winter days, you need some additional energy. And this is also from regional energy, from wood. Wood chips are used uh, with a heat facility plant uh, to um, also give heat into the village heat grid. There are uh, different ownership models which we used in different villages. Sometimes it was that the farmers only uh, produced the biomass. All the other things, the biogas plant, the heat village heat grid and the heat facility plant was uh, built and owned by the uh, village uh, cooperative. All our projects started, projects started with cooperatives, whereas uh, farmers are members of the cooperative as well. So all together uh, um, are working together. Uh, there's another model in this. There's a farmer who um, produces the biomass, but who also owns the um, bioenergy plant and the village builds the heat grid. It's a, it's a high investment, I have to say. In a, in a small village, it's more than a million euro, which was needed to, for this investment. And in, this is more in smaller villages where there's sometimes it is the farmer or some farmers who work together who own all, who also build the heat grid. But it shows, I think, that all of the people involved are participating and are working together in this project. Um, there were, I, perhaps I, I could describe three phases of implementing this um, project and the initiation phase, the planning phase, and the building phase, uh, which was really ambitious. Um, and I, I think I, I can go deeper into this, um, but uh, I, I want to show you in the next slide what was needed for these different phases. And uh, I, I tried to do that and to say that, yes, uh, at this phase, it was manpower was the main thing what was needed. And in other, it was uh, money what was needed. And um, I do it a little bit quicker. And what you see that manpower was needed, especially in the initial uh, phase. When you had to, to, to talk, to go to the villages, to talk to them, to convince them to make, and that's what I said before, to make these projects, the projects of, of the village people. And, and I want, uh, on, on this point, I want to quote uh, a mayor. It was a conservative mayor of a little village after we, presented slides to show the, uh, um, the, the facts of climate change. And um, the mayor said, yes, I want to have an answer when my grandchildren ask me, what did you do against climate change? And I will say, yes, I acted. And that's, I think, something which is very, very important to understand what uh, CLLD, what leader what local initiatives can do. And that means this was the, the, the first steps to bring, uh, to, to make this project the project uh, of the people. I think it's too much to go into the, uh, deeper into the financing system of this, um, but perhaps I should go to the, uh, <clears throat> to the point that leader was, uh, Oh, I see, uh, you see another, uh, you see another uh, um, monitor than I see. 
uh, from my presentation. No, I was um, seeing yours, but I was seeing okay. yours. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and leader was only a, a very small amount of the money that was needed. Most of the, the money was uh, from cooperative loans. That, that means the people in the villages had to, to find the money to implement these projects. And one, uh, one of, the, uh, uh, of the basics uh, for these projects were that the, the German law, the Renewable Energy Sources Act, and this law guaranteed feed-in tariffs for renewable power for 20 years. And that made, uh, makes the investment in renewable energy system calculable and safe. And that was very, very important. And nowadays, the EEG is no longer in force and no more biogas plant is uh, projected. So uh, that's what I wanted to say in, the, in my first part, to say you need the, the legal framework, you need the political framework to make these uh, opportunities uh, real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yes, and to give a short summary, these are uh, this is the first uh, bioenergy village on the left side, Yunde, and um, I hope it works. We had a competition when we tried to find new villages to, to go with us, and 34 villages applied for uh, going the same way and being uh, uh, bioenergy villages, and we financed nine feasibility studies. And at the end, finally, we had four new bioenergy villages in our region. Mm -hmm. Wow. And One with time. this, sorry, with this slide, I want to show you that what is the most important factor when trying to implement such uh, projects? It's the people. They are needed and they must be enthusiasm with a project like this. Otherwise, you, you wouldn't have a chance. You can't sell this to the people in, uh, like someone who wants to sell anything, but they must really find that this emotionally find that it is their own goal to do something against climate change, for example. Yes, and what is the benefit for uh, the environment? It is the reduction of CO2 emission, it's increasing plant diversity, it's reduction of soil erosion and nitrite leaching, it's the, uh, minimizing pesticide treatments, and uh, you can fertilize with digestion residues. So it's a circular, uh, a very local circular uh, producing. Yes, and I want to uh, finish with, uh, another picture of how new energy and, and new projects can be combined with a very traditional old uh, village situation um, where people are willing to go this way and uh, people uh, are, are already uh, prepared to pay a lot of money to go this way without knowing if it works or not. We have one project where two villages have been, uh, were combined and until now they invested more than 10 million euros in this project. And the villages uh, have uh, the size of six or 700 inhabitants. So small, quite small villages. So, and with this, I would like to, to finish and say, say thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Hartmut, for this presentation. This is very, very impressive. Um, so one can see that um, local action is already happening and what it needs is the right political framework, which hopefully the EU Green Deal will provide because circular economy is one part, um, zero pollution another. So there are all the bits and pieces of a systemic view within this policy package and it will reach local levels. And this is also the message of today's event. Thank you, Hartmut. I'm looking at the, at the, at the time and um, we, had, we now will have a break until I suggest to do until 12,
20, which is four minutes break. Um, so after this break, you will have the opportunity to, I'm sorry, that's my telephone. After this break, you will have the opportunity to learn about a cooperation between ELAD and ECOLIS, which is a community of practice. Sorry, I'm just going to switch it off. And um, we will also have the opportunity for networking and asking questions to, to all the speakers. And I'd also like to flag up, and that's a question to Juan, if you can find the slide uh, with the survey, because we have prepared a survey within this community of practice on CLLD and the leader approach. And what we want to do, we have presented to you now four good practice examples on cooperation locally between local action groups and um, community led initiatives. And I've just posted the link to the survey in the chat because we want to have more great ex inspiring ex examples. So if you know of anyone, anything and a project, if you're doing one yourself, um, please go to this link, um, have a look at it, fill it in, or also contact us at ecolise, info at ecolise.eu, because we're really interested in to hear about you. Now Nina. I let you leave. Now it's twelve eighteen. Nina, uh, I have a, I have a suggestion. Sorry to cut you now. I have a suggestion? Yes. Could we could we maybe take two three more minutes of break? Because if not, yes, yes, yes. That's what I wanted to say, Juan. What do you suggest, Juan? I don't know. We could be back at uh, uh, twenty five past. Very good. Five more so minutes. Five more yes, minutes. It will be good. Twenty five. And afterwards, you will hear about the new community of practice and get to network. See you back at 12.25. Thank you. Have a nice rest. See you now. Thank you, Nina.
Okay, so welcome back. We have a good, a good rest. Thank you, Juan. And thank you, Abdul, for the great music. So we are recording again. And again, those of you who you don't want to be recorded, um, please uh, switch off your camera. And welcome back. And I invite you because we're now taking the next step and um, we will be networking. So the plan for this session until 1 p.m is really to first present you a community of practice which Elad and Ecolise have set up. It's already started and it's a community of practice on the leader and CLLD approach for local climate and environmental action. And um, then we will have a networking round which is uh, about 20 minutes and we will go into breakout rooms and hopefully we will have one uh, leader and CLLD expert or EU Green Deal expert in every breakout room. And I can see that there is Marek Hartig, who is a council member of Ecolise and also an experienced local action expert. So we will try to divide the participants so each breakout room has experts in their breakout room. So. Turn on the gallery view and just take a moment again to look around and see who is in the room. Usually the communities for future sessions are, I'd say, much more different. We do a lot of stretching, sometimes yoga, sometimes uh, the gorilla, the gorilla cry. I'm not going to do this now because we don't have time and Ecolise is also about, you know, connecting with the mainstream. <laughs> but next, the next event promised you will experience some of the different sessions of communities for future. And now I would like to invite uh, Hartmut Bernd and Eamon O'Hara. Because um, we have a community of practice and um, we would like to present this to you and maybe Eamon, could you start by telling us what is this community of practice about? What, what does Ecolise want with it? Thanks, Nina. Um, so, yeah, I mentioned earlier that we have an initiative called Communities for Future and Communities for Future, I guess, is very much about mainstreaming or, or kind of wider sharing of the experience that has been built up within the Ecolise network and the Ecolise community. Um, and the goal is, as I said, is sharing this more, more widely and mainstreaming. And in order to achieve this, there's very much a recognition that we need to work with other partners, other organizations to, to make that possible. Um, and Communities for Future is this space, it's a space to work with other partners. And within Communities for Futures, for Future, we also have other spaces. And one of these is the Community of Practice on Community-Led Local Development. And that's a, a specific space to work with stakeholders from the CLLD community. So specifically ELARD, uh, which we've heard about, uh, but also the European Rural Parliament, the Smart Villages Network. So the idea was to really to bring together different stakeholders, different stakeholders. from the CLLD community. I don't know if you can still hear me okay. Yeah. So different stakeholders from the CLLD community to look at how we could work together to support this kind of mainstreaming. And specifically, I suppose what we were seeing was, was some disconnect if you like on the one hand our members were kind of uh, highlighting the issue of accessing funding and resources difficulties uh, and lack of awareness about cld and about leader um, on the leader side we were hearing about issues and hartman just mentioned about the survey and uh, less uh, interest in, in maybe environmental type projects uh, and less bottom-up projects on, on environment and climate action. But at the same time, we were hearing from communities that there was a lot of concern about climate change, a lot of 
anxiety and a wish to engage and to be involved in, in more action oriented initiatives. So this kind of disconnect was noticeable, if you like, and the ideas of the COP is really to explore this together and see how together we can kind of come forward with some ideas for how that could be addressed. And there's various different activities uh, within the COP. This event is one of the outputs of the COP so far. We've had another event uh, December last year. Um, we have a proposal to work on a giant policy paper, which maybe could address some of the issues Hartman mentioned as well. Uh, a survey, which we've shared <coughs> already. Um, and uh, what else? Yeah, I mean, part of the idea as well is to support networking at other levels. And we have a networking session now, but that we don't just keep the COP activity, if you like, at the, at the European level, but also try and create opportunities to build uh, collaboration and partnership at other levels, so at national, regional, local level as well. That's it, Nina, in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Eamon. So I've just posted a link to this community of practice on community-led local development on in the chat. So Eamon keeps speaking of COP. <laughs> he means the community of practice. And um, my question to Hartmut uh, is, uh, what, 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 what benefits can you see in general in working together with community-led initiatives and an association such as Ecolise on this, because it's really, ELAD is a, a, a member of this COP on CLLD. There is other members like the European Rural Parliament. So what in your view is uh, a benefit of such a community of practice, which is basically about learning and exchanging and talking to each other as we're doing now? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, uh, Nina. Sorry, I think a, a lot of the problem problems um, uh, we all also have with the leader uh, has have, have been already mentioned in this conference, and um, uh, that that means we have to work for 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 change, and we have to work for improving this. Uh, uh, CLLD or this local um, approach, and and one is that, uh, and and we you could also see it in the in the chat that uh, until now, uh, only leader is mandatory. So the other funds do not have this uh, system that um, every fund has a, a specified amount for this local uh, um, approach. Uh, that's the first one, and the second is that. Um, a leader is very close connected to the second pillar of the common agricultural policy, and and that means the priorities in this uh, in the regulations for for the EA FRD for this second pillar are, are very much focused on agriculture and farming, and not on local uh, on on rural development and local development, and it's uh, sometimes it's a fight to to um, Give the uh, the the the, uh, the issues the importance they must have. Then, because in in most of of uh, our regions, uh, farming is a is a is important, but not that important. Many people are uh, are working outside of of agriculture and things like that. So we need it, uh, we need to open it. And to, we need to, we were fighting for the multi-fund uh, approach. That means to combine all the all the local uh, the CLLD approaches of all funds. And that did not happen really in most of the member states because it's really complicated to do that. And it's not mandatory in the, in the other funds. So uh, there we, we hope of, that there is some improvement uh, but as we uh, had to realize, not in the coming uh, period, but we are working on that. And when I said it's very complicated, that means, uh, and that has al already been mentioned as well, that uh, the system of EU funding is very bureaucratic. And that means that those people we want to, to, to reach 
the uh, those who are engaged as uh, who are engaged as as actors on the local level uh, they um, they do not have the right access to the money and to the support of of leader so it's a it's very much a, a task of the of the uh, regional managements which are mandatory with leader to to translate all these complicated bureaucratic acts to uh, to those people and to support them um, so there are a lot of tasks to be done and i hope that with the the partnership uh, of both and the partnership with Ecolis, uh, that this uh, um, is forcing us and strengthening uh, the idea and of uh, and uh, the the impression of the importance of of these CLID approaches. Thank you, Hartmut. So um, this is really the moment also to go into the networking phase and to ask the questions which I'm sure have built up. And we have Laurence Graff uh, still with us. Uh, so Laurence Graff is of Directorate General uh, Klima in the European Commission. And Laurence is uh, standing for the EU Climate Pact. She's an advisor to DG Klima on the EU Climate Pact, so on how to reach citizens and communities with the EU Green Deal. And um, I suggest to do one breakout room uh, just for uh, Laurence. And sorry to my colleagues, this is a change of, of what we have uh, planned. But I think it's really important to give people the opportunity to interact with Laurence. So if I can ask to have, we will have four topical uh, rooms uh, according to the good practice examples. So it is a biodiversity room. It's a sustainable energy room with Hartmut Bernd on bioenergy. It is a regional development uh, policy room with Nara Petrovic. And it is a room on climate action with Davy Phillips. And there will be a room with Laurence Graff on everything around EU Green Deal and EU Climate Pact. We're about 60 people. We have so, five rooms. Nina, just to check it because I'm, I'm working on this right now live with yes. Paulina. Yes. Um, so then it's not four topics, two rooms per topic, but instead of that, it's five rooms with more yeah. people, like about yes, 12, I 15 think, people per yeah. room. Yeah, I think that's better because this way we have the experts in the room and we're sure to have someone who can ask, uh, answer questions. And hey, Paulina, and I see um, your face there. Yeah, I, I can just say on that that I have created rooms with a size of uh, seven or eight people, which is already quite a good size. If it's more, there will be less space to ask questions and there's experts in each room, but not necessarily the ones who have been presenting. So uh, I, I have eight groups. And it would be easier to just to launch these at the moment. Yeah, if, so I suggest just to assign one room to Laurence Graff because this is really the novelty. Yes, and we, done, if we could done. just name this room with Laurence and also name the breakout rooms maybe with the um, experts present if that's possible, if not, not. So people know where they can go. And it's also, it's a breakout room, but you know, uh, if you're interested after 10 minutes in another <clears> breakout <throat> room, Juan and Paulina, can people change breakout rooms? Uh, yeah, people can normally change. But, okay. Uh, so if you want to change... But my, I, I, I have an advice. Mm -hmm. We don't have much time mm -hmm. for this. It's very short. Believe me, you will not want to change because it's too short. So please, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> uh, Paulina, before before we do it, do you want to do you want to say anything else? Well, I can open the rooms, and if somebody feels like you're in a wrong room and you would like to have another topic, then just come to the main room, and I will change the room okay. for you. And before you before you do it, um, I'm going to share again with all of you here in the chat the link to the main presentation. Okay, so you will see that in the presentation, there's some space for harvesting. And there's some slides specifically for the breakouts with some guidelines. 
So if you want, you can also look at it. But I don't want to take more time. So Paulina, over to you. Okay. So I open the rooms now. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Nina, and everyone. Okay, so I think almost everyone is back. I hope the breakouts were good. Uh, so Nina, over back to you. I think Emily is going to be now with the closing, if I'm right. We don't have much time, but... Yes, the closing will not take much time. And um, I think, Amelie, I would like to give you the floor and say something about the community of practice on CLLD on community-led local development and also mention again, because we had put it into the chat, the survey, which we're looking for successful projects. So Amelie is the policy officer for Pol uh, at Ecolise. Amelie, what is this community of practice? What are its next steps? Yes, uh, thanks again for um, everyone to be here. I think it was an amazing discussion. We heard a lot of very inspiring examples of how to bring the European Green Deal to the local level. And it's exciting that we can finally have these discussions together with uh, a lot of representatives of the leader world and also representatives of the Ecolis network being here together today. And that's really what this community of practice is about, that we start engaging with each other, that we start um, creating a common vision for how to actually implement sustainable community-led projects through the leader mechanism. And um, that's what we are inviting you to, 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 to join the working group and to sign up to our newsletter where you will be informed about further action steps in the future. I know that there is a little time frame to act now, a window of opportunity to, to, to really be on time with regards to the really um, um, ambitious goals that we, we need to strive for in terms of reaching the climate targets to, to prevent a, an ecological cat catastrophe. And that would be amazing if we could collaborate on this together. So um, that's uh, on, the, on the working group. And then there's also the survey that has already been mentioned uh, once again for you in the chat, um, you can find a link for the survey, which is uh, supposed to also lead to a policy paper by the different um, people who and organizations who have set it up, which are ELART members, Equalis stakeholders, and the ERP partners. And um, we are looking for best practices in the field of the cooperation between local action groups and community-led initiatives. And the survey will guide you through a, a bunch of different questions on tools and met methodologies, on barriers for climate action, on enabling factors. So it's really crucial for us to better understand what we can bring to this world and how to do this together. So thanks uh, for being here and I will send the survey link in the chat. That's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Amelie, for this. And um, at this point, uh, take another look at this room. I hope that in the follow up to this event, we will send the recordings, the presentations, and also ask the participants if they're okay with sharing their contact so we can form a little group of uh, CLLD aficionados. Um, thanks a lot also to the team who supported of Ecolise. This was really teamwork and I'm very happy about this. And thank you also to our partner Elad who put a lot of work into this as well. Beata Stützchen is with us as well, um, Beata. And Hartmut who contributed. So thanks to all of us and thank you for staying with us so long and have a good lunch break now. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye to everyone.
feel, feel free to open the mic and say goodbye to everyone if you want. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All have a nice day. Bye. 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 Thank you so much, Bye. Nina and Emily. For Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you so, so much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Let's continue all together. Thank you. Bye-bye.